welcome you this evening to our fourth lecture in the Science Times series in honor of Aaron Lundin. Um, I'm here to introduce you to Professor Von Bassler, who is a very distinguished scientist and my neighbor. Um, Dr. Bassler is a professor of molecular biology at Princeton University. She received her BS in biochemistry from the University of California at Davis and a PhD in biochemistry from the Johns Hopkins University. She has done postdoctoral work in genetics at the Aburin Institute, and in 1994 she joined our faculty here at Princeton. Dr. Bassler is the Director of Graduate Studies in the Molecular Biology Department, and she teaches both undergraduates and graduates. <laughs> Dr. Bassler has accumulated many awards in her time at Princeton. In 2002, she was awarded the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. The same year, she was elected to the American Academy of Microbiology, and she became a fellow of that academy in 2004. In 2005, she was named a Howard Hughes Medical Investigator. In 2006, she was the recipient of the ASM Eli Lilly Investigator Award. She's also the editor for Molecular Microbiology and Annual Reviews of Genetics, and she's an associate editor of the journal Bacterial Biology. She serves on many grant, fellowship, and award review panels in her spare time for various agencies like the NSF and the David Brennan Cancer Foundation. At the university, the research in her laboratory focuses on the molecular mechanisms that bacteria use for intercellular communication, a process that's called quorum sensing. Tonight, she's going to tell us about cell-to-cell -cell communication in bacteria in what she has called tiny conspiracies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Von Nessler. So they're out there, and the way bacteria grow 
is that they simply double in size and then they pinch themselves in half in the middle. So they divide mostly asexually and they just double, double, double. So they're clones of each other. They're just identical copies of each other. And so everybody has thought that they just live these sort of individualistic lives and each bacterium does its own thing, sort of in isolation from every other bacterium. But of course, if you read the New York Times at all, you know that bacteria have us on our knees. You know, we, they are the most incredibly proficient organism. They're the biggest biomass on Earth. Right? They do all these terrible things that we read about in the newspaper. But they do also all kinds of wonderful things that we couldn't live without as well. And what's become clear to us in the past decade is that there's no way bacteria, these tiny, tiny little creatures, could be so successful if they were simply acting as individuals. Because it would be impossible for them to have a significant impact on their environment. And so what I'll try to show you tonight is that that isn't how they live. What they have done is that they've developed language, and the language is chemical. So they speak with chemical words. And what happens is as these bacteria double in size, like I told you, when they just grow and divide in half, as the bacteria double, they release small molecules into the environment that you can think of like hormones or pheromones. And so as the cells are growing, since they're all making and releasing these molecules into the environment, the more cells there are, the more of these molecules there are on the external environment. And so what happens is when the molecules hit a certain amount, which is proportional to the number of cells in a given environment, the bacteria have sort of detectors or little antennas for these molecules. They detect these molecules, and then all the bacteria change their gene expression, which is just behavior in unison. And so what happens is that the entire population of bacteria switch behaviors as one. And so in fact, what they're doing is acting like enormous <coughs> multicellular organisms. And this is all mediated by chemical communication. And I'm going to try to explain to you how we've learned about this in the last 10 years. And so that's the way they talk. They talk with chemicals. And this all started um, this idea of bacteria talking to each other all started in two incredibly ridiculous and harmless bacteria that are marine bacteria. And one of them is named Vibrio fisheri, and it lives as a symbiont in this organism, which is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. So what you're looking at is a full-grown squid that's been turned on its back and dissected down the middle. And what you can see right here are these two lobes of what are a specialized light organ that sits under the mantle or the body of the squid. And this bacterium, Vibrio fissurei, lives inside of this light organ at something like 10 to the 12 cells per mil. We have no idea how the squid grows the bacteria to this high cell number. We've never managed that in the lab. But it's in there, and it's making one of these hormones, which we call autoinducers. And these autoinducers are trapped inside the light organ with the bacteria in this squid. So the bacteria are in there, all this molecule is in there, so it tells the bacteria you're at high cell number, and it tells them they should all change their behavior. And what Fibrio fisheri does is it makes bioluminescence. So it's like firefly light, except that the light is blue. And so what happens is the cells are in there, they're at high cell number, this little hormone is in there, and all the bacteria make light. In exchange for that, the squid feeds it. So this light organ is loaded with amino acids and sugars and all kinds of great things that the bacteria want to live on. So it's a much richer, happy, fatter life to be inside this light organ than to fend for yourself free living in the ocean. So the selection from the bacterium's point of view is that it can grow to high numbers because the squid feeds it. Now the squid does this, puts up with all these shenanigans, because of course it wants this bacterium. So the way that this symbiosis works is this squid, it's a very dramatic picture, but it's only this big, full-grown, <laughs> this is called cheap theatrics. This is called the start of the cheap theatrics. Anyway, so this squid, this full-grown squid, is called the Hawaiian bobtail squid because it lives just off the coast of Hawaii, so just in sort of shallow, knee-deep water. And this squid is nocturnal. So during the day, it buries itself in the sand and it sleeps. But then at night, it has to come out to hunt. And so since it lives in just this shallow water, on bright nights when there's lots of starlight or moonlight, that light can penetrate the depth of the water the squid lives in. So what the squid has developed is a shutter. It's just the squid's ink sac that it can open and close over that specialized light organ. And then the squid has detectors on its back that sense how much starlight or moonlight is hitting its back. And then it opens and closes this shutter. So the <laughs> amount of light coming out of the bottom, which is made by the bacteria, exactly matches how much light hits the squid's back. So the squid doesn't make a shadow. 
So this is sort of like the spelt bar of the ocean. It uses the light made by the bacteria to counter-illuminate itself so it doesn't cast a shadow so that if it's swimming over some predator, the, the predator can't see a shadow, you know, calculates the squid's trajectory and eat it. So this is an anti-predation device. But then if you think about it, this squid has this terrible problem because it's got this 10 to the 12 cells per mil culture in this light organ, and it can't maintain that indefinitely. So what happens is every morning when the squid goes back to sleep, the sun comes up and it buries itself in the sand, and then it's got a pump that's attached to its circadian rhythm. So when the sun comes up, what the squid does is it pumps out like 95% of the bacteria. So now the bacteria have to loop, and that little molecule, that signal molecule, the autoinducer is gone. The bacteria aren't making light, but of course the squid doesn't care because it's asleep in the sand. As the day goes by, as I told you, these bacteria double, double, double. They're all making and releasing this molecule. And so at night, the bacteria detect, the molecule builds up, the bacteria build up in number, the bacteria detect it, and they turn on light exactly when the squid needs it. And so it's sort of the self-perpetuating way to keep this beautiful symbiosis. I got a million of those. Uh, <laughs> I have one like of Okay, so, so this was this amazing sort of anomaly of this weirdo bacterium that was clearly talking to its neighbors with this molecule. And so we wanted to understand how that worked. And so what we did was to just make mutants. I mean, this is what a geneticist does. We make mutants that were defective in that process, in the bacteria, and then figured out what were the genes and the proteins involved in the process. And so what we did, what we found, was that there was a gene and a protein that we named Lux I. Everything tonight will be called Lux I for the Lux for the god of light. I mean, you know, we're scientists, we have to get our jellies somehow. So everything's called Lux. So there's a protein. These arrows can drive me wild. Okay, so there's a protein that we called Lux I for the inducer. This protein makes this little signal molecule that I have as these green tri green pentagons here. And that diffuses out of the cell, so it increases in the surroundings in proportion to cell numbers, right? The more cells, the more that molecule. And then there's a partner protein that we call Lux R for regulation. Lux R is the autoinducer or the hormone binding protein. So what happens when the hormone reaches a certain amount, Lux R can find it and bind it. And then what happens is when Lux R is connected to that signal molecule, this complex sits on the DNA that encodes the enzymes, which are called luciferase, that make the light that the bacteria makes. So it's a very simple circuit. The more cells there are, the more that signal there is. Luxar binds it at a particular cell density, and then together they turn on light. And why that's interesting is because in the last 10 years, hundreds of species of bacteria have been found to have highly conserved lux I enzymes they all make a signal molecule that's released to the outside. They all have a partner, Lux R protein, that binds the signal molecule. And together, these complexes turn on genes that bacteria want to express when they're a community, but not when they're alone. And so now we have a fancy name for this. We call it quorum sensing. The bacteria vote, they count the vote, and then they act as a quorum. <laughs> And so, so we know now a lot about how these little networks work. We also know a lot about these signals. So all of the Lux I enzymes make a, make a related set of signals. And they're what are called acylhomosterine lactones. And so all I did on this slide is to put a few bacteria. So each thing, that's a name of a particular species of bacteria. And then the signal molecule that it makes. And so this, this would be those red pentagons. And so what you can see if you look on, at these molecules is that the right hand part of the molecule, this part, is identical in every single bacterium. But this less, left part, these are just carbons, this chain that's on the left part is different in every <coughs> single species. And what that does is to confer exquisite species specificity to these languages. So each of these molecules only interacts with its partner Luxar protein and no other. So these are private conversations that these bacteria are having. They are species specific. And so what I mean by that, if I take that second signal, which is made by a bacterium called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, if I add that to Virgo fisheri, nothing happens. And likewise, the Virgo fisheri signal has no effect on Pseudomonas. So these languages allow the bacteria to count their own species. So that's about the signals, the chemistry of the signals. 
We also know what the, these little circuits are doing, these corn sensing circuits are doing in different bacteria. So I told you about Virgo fissuri. This circuit turns on bioluminescence at high cell density when this bacterium is inside of a squid. Pseudomonas originosa, the bacterium that I just told you about, turns on virulence, all of its pathogenicity genes and biofilm genes with corn sensing. So Pseudomonas originosa is just a sort of harmless bacterium that lives in the dirt. It's just a regular bacteria that you, you walk on every single day, and it's not a problem unless you have cystic fibrosis. So you know that people who have cystic fibrosis have a genetic defect in their lungs, so they can't clear and sterilize their lungs. And what happens is that those people get infections all the time. You know, you and I breathe stuff in and we have mechanisms to get rid of all these bacteria. What happens is that people who have CF end up having an uh, infection in their lungs of all kinds of different bacteria for something like 30 years. And what happens is typically a person who has CF in his or her teens will become permanently colonized by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And that's the bacterium that kills people that have CF. They die from a Pseudomonas aeruginosa effect, infection. And the reason is because Pseudomonas makes what's called a biofilm. So it adheres to the, to the person's lungs in this sort of slime. It's the same stuff that's on your teeth every morning. Those are biofilms. So there's, the bacteria sit adhere to the lung. And then what they do is they express 50 or 75 genes that make proteins that make the people sick. So these are products that are secreted outside of the cells. And they're terrible proteins that sort of chew up and damage the person's lung tissue. And so that's why a person with CF dies. All of these genes are controlled by core sensing. And so of course it sounds very terrible, and it is, but if you think about it from the bacterium's point of view, it's a brilliant strategy. What a bacterium, any pathogenic bacterium, doesn't want to do is for one or a few bacteria to get in you and then just start secreting these toxins. That's why your immune system evolved. Your immune system evolved to do surveillance to look for bacteria. So the better idea from the bacterium's point of view is to wait and to count themselves with these small molecules and recognize when they have the right cell number that if they all act together, they can accomplish some task that they couldn't accomplish if there were fewer of them. So for example, virulence. And so now we know that hundreds of pathogenic species of bacteria control all of the things that make us sick using quorum sensing. They realize, I mean, I don't want to get too anthropomorphic, that they can't do it unless they do it in high numbers. So that's Pseudomonas. Agrobacterium tubifacians is a plant pathogen. It kind of causes crown gall tumors on plants. This bacterium actually has a, a mobile piece of DNA that contains all of the pathogenicity genes on it. And what this bacteria controls with quorum sensing is the spreading around of these genes between different members of the bacterial community. This is the bacteria's idea of sex. You guys are adults. Sex is a social function. <laughs> if you're trying to give your DNA to somebody, you want a recipient. I don't want to get too much into that. But obviously, that should be controlled by the group. right? It doesn't do these bacteria any good to spit their DNA out if there's nobody there to get it. So, so mating in bacteria is controlled by corn sensing. Arunia caratibora is the bacterium that makes your lettuce turn brown in the refrigerator, makes your potatoes turn brown. That bacterium is brilliant. What it does is it controls virulence factors, just like Pseudomonas. It, it controls all of the sort of enzymes that it secretes to, say, make a wound in your potato or in the lettuce. It controls all of those by quorum so it seems the same sort of strategy. You need a lot of bacteria to make those wounds effective. But at the same time that it's releasing all of its virulence factors, it also controls, with quorum sensing, the release of antibiotics that it's immune to. But if you think about it out in the field, with, in the dirt, it's trying to make a wound in a plant. And if it releases antibiotics at the same time, it can fend off all the other competitor bacteria that would try to come in and take advantage of the wound that it makes for itself. So it keeps that potato or whatever for itself. So this list goes on and on and on. But I think the idea that, that should be obvious is that the kinds of traits that are controlled by quorum sensing are ones that are only successful if lots of bacteria carry them out in synchrony. And so that's the way we understand quorum sensing right now. And so uh, what I hope I said was that we actually discovered quorum sensing in two bacteria, Vibrio fissuri, this bioluminescent symbiotic bacteria, and also a cousin of it named Vibrio harvii. So Vibrio harvii is very closely related to Vibrio fissuri, but it lives a completely different lifestyle. Vibrio harvii is a free-living bioluminescent bacterium in the ocean. And so you're actually, I thought you would want to see this bioluminescence, so you're actually looking at it on this slide. This is just a person from my lab holding a flask. 
this is a flask, and this is just a liquid culture of this bacterium, Vibrio harvii. And so to take this picture, all I did was turn the lights off in the room, and this is what we see. So this is bioluminescence made by, so I took the picture with the light made from the bacteria. Right? And the reason I'm showing you this is because I wanted to try tonight to give you an idea of what we do in our lab. And so this bacterium we also knew only turned on light at high cell number so that it was a quorum sensing effect, just like Vibrio fish dry. And so what we want to do is, we, what we thought when we got interested in this other bacteria, Vibrio harvia, we thought this bacteria doesn't have this nice, nice lifestyle where it lives in this pure culture in the light organ of the squid. This bacterium lives free living in the ocean. It's got to encounter a dynamic and changing environment. And so we thought maybe its quorum sensing system would be tuned in to more environmental sort of sensory you know, information than Vibrio fish dry. So we wanted to study this bacteria. And so the reason, and this, we like these bioluminescent bacteria, is because, in fact, my sort of dirty secret is we don't even care about the bioluminescence. The bioluminescence for us is a reporter of the cells talking to each other. When the cells talk, they make light. And we're geneticists in my lab, and so what a geneticist sort of bag of tricks is, is that we make mutants that are impaired in some function. And so what we want to do is to understand how the cell-cell communication works. And what's so great about bioluminescence is we can just make mutants, play these bacteria out on petri plates by the thousands, and just turn the lights off in the room and look for bacteria that aren't making light when they should be, or are making light when they shouldn't be. And I mean, a dummy can do this. You can just turn the lights on and walk, whether you're glowing in the dark like that or not. And so this is sort of like genetics for dopes and everything that I've ever told you about my life has been incredibly successful at that experiment. So this is our trick. Right? And so that's what we did in Vibrio fisheri, and this is what we did in this free living bacteria in Vibrio harvii. We simply used this light as a reporter of the communication made mutants that were impaired in that and asked what was wrong with them by finding the genes that the mutations were in. And surprisingly, when we looked at this free-living bacterium, Vibrio harvii, what we found is that the quorum sensing circuitry was completely different from Vibrio fisheri and these hundreds of other species that I told you about. So what we saw in these, so this is a model for the Vibrio harvii quorum sensing circuit. So this is supposed to be the cell, right, this round thing. So this would be the outside, and this would, this would be the inside, the cytoplasm. And so what we saw immediately is that the bacterium actually made two signals. And so we called them, remember we call these autoinducers. Autoinducer 1, that's the green triangles, and autoinducer 2. Autoinducer 1, I already showed you a picture of. This is a homocerine lactone. You know, like those other signals, it's one of these run-of-the-mill form sensing signals that's used for intraspecies communication. But what we also saw was that there was this second autoinducer. It's going to be the red diamonds in all of my cartoons, which we you know, cleverly call autoinducer 2, since we already had autoinducer 1. And then each of these autoinducers is detected by a sensor protein that sort of sits in the membrane. So the sensor for autoinducer 1 is called LUX-N. The sensor for autoinducer 2 is called LUX-Q. Those are just the names that we gave those proteins. And they sort of sit in the membrane with their noses sticking out so they can detect when these signals accumulate. And then the information from both signals go, gets sent to a protein called LUXO, and LUXO's job is to turn on or off luciferase, which then, of course, you know, makes the bacteria turn on or off light. And so what happens is that at low cell number, when the signals aren't there, LUXO doesn't work. So light is turned off. At high cell density, when those sensors get tickled by these signals, LUXO turns on luciferase. And so at some level, by doing this kind of molecular biology, which is what we you know, do for a living in my lab, we could understand how this worked right? by doing these kinds of tricks. But the real question for us, when we sort of step back and thought about the biology here, is why would the bacteria build it this way? Why have two signals? When one, I already showed you, these hundreds of other bacteria, these Lux IR circuits, one signal works perfectly fine. What's the point of having two signals that feed into the same pathway? And so we didn't know that, but we thought these signals must encode different pieces of information, or the bacteria wouldn't do it this way. And so we wanted to explore that. So the experiment we decided to do is to make reporter strings, so Vibrio harvii reporter strings that could only respond to one or the other signal. So we made a mutant that was, oh, sorry, I'm supposed to tell you, 
<laughs> just tell you that we always measure light, right? It's easy. You, know, you just turn the lights off in the room. But what I also want to just tell you is that when a bacteria decides to go from going alone to acting as part of a group, this is an enormous, definitive biological decision. And so we're always measuring the light as the output of this. But what we've shown in the lab is that 100 genes turn on or off when these bacteria make these decisions, right? So it's a huge change in behavior from I'm acting as an individual to I'm going to do what the gang is doing. But remember, so even though all of that is happening in every experiment we do, we simply use as sort of our canonical readout the bioluminescence. Okay, so, so, sorry, I should have told you that. But so then we wanted to know why are there two signals? So to explore that idea, we made Vibrio-Harvey isotrates that were defective in listening to one of the two signals. So we made a mutant that didn't have the LUX-Q gene or the LUX-Q protein. So that, in that mutant, this autoducer 1 <coughs> signal can still interact with lux -N, and that can turn on light, right? That circuit works fine. And then we made the opposite mutant. We made a mutant that couldn't hear, if you will, autoducer 1. So it was missing lux -N, so it still had autoducer 2, and light could turn on when it saw that signal. And then what we did is we just collected up every bacterium that we could find. And then remember, these signals are on the outside of the cells, right? So what one can do is to just grow up big cultures of the bacteria, spin the bacteria with the centrifuge, just remove the bacteria, and take the, the liquid that they were grown in. And that's where the signals are. And so we did that. We just took every bacterium we could find, and then we took the cell-free liquid that they've been grown in, and we added them to this reporter strain, or we added them to this reporter strain, and then we measured how much light that made. And what we found was that we could never find any other species of bacteria that may put something in its fluids that turn on light through this circuit. But every bacteria we tested made something that if you added it to the real Harvey, it turned on light through the second circuit. So it was if no other bacteria had autoducer 1, and that makes sense because remember that's this homoserine lactone molecule that is for intraspecies communication. That's Vibrio Harvey's private language. But every bacterium we tested made autoinducer two. So our interpretation of that result is that these are two different languages. The autoinducer one language says me, but the autoinducer two language, that molecule is made by all bacteria. So this is sort of the bacterial Esperanto. This is the trade language the bacteria use to communicate between species. It says other. And so if you think about it, or we thought about it, you know, the only place this bacteria ever grows by itself is in a test tube in Princeton, New Jersey, right? When it's out there in the ocean, or all bacteria that are out, you know, that you encounter, or that encounter each other, they live in mixtures with thousands of other species. And if it turns out that we're right about corn sensing, and the, the goal of corn sensing is to count, there has to be a way that bacteria have evolved to take a census of other bacteria besides their own species. Because it could be that they're an amazing minority of any given population. So what we think autoinducer 1 and autoinducer 2 do is allow them to measure the ratio of themselves to other bacteria. And so to show you that this is not completely in ridiculous bacteria that you've never heard of, <laughs> this is the same experiment I'm talking about, right? We have this Vibrio harvey bacterium that turns on light when you give it autoinducer 2. And so what we did with that is we just painted it. This is just a picture of a petri plate. I took a picture of it in the light. Then I turned the lights off in the room and took another picture of the plate. And painted here in this double-headed arrow, this is that Vibrio Harvey reporter strain that turns on light when it's presented with autoinducer 2. Over here on the left side of the plate, this is E. coli 0157, that's when you get a jack in the box. And over here, this is the equivalent <laughs> salmonella that you get at some other restaurant, you're kind of used to them, But, oh well. Um, and anyway, what you can see is that they're drawn so that they're close to the tips of the arrows, but they don't touch it. But then if we turn the lights off in the room, the tips of the arrows light up. And that's because E. coli and salmonella are making autoinducer 2 that's just diffusing across this petri plate. Vibrio Harvey is responding and turning on light. But in fact, it wasn't every single bacteria that we could find. This thing over the top and the bottom of the middle of the arrow, this is a domesticated bacterial strain. It's a cloning strain that's been used in labs for almost 70 years. It's completely avirulent. And if you look at the middle, it doesn't make autoinducer 2. So Vibrio Harvey doesn't turn on light. And so sure enough, we could show that the more virulent or the more wild these bacteria strains were, the more of this molecule they made. 
So then we started to really get interested in this, because if it was true that this molecule was a generic molecule, and if, like in these other form sensing systems, autoducer 2 controls virulence, and it's in all of these different bacteria, then one can start to think about making new kinds of antibiotics. So of course you know, you know, there's no new antibiotics, bacteria are becoming resistant, there's nothing coming down the pipeline. So the idea in the pharmaceutical industry now is that what one would like to do is to stop killing the bacteria and selecting for resistant mutants, but instead to make sort of behavior modification drugs, meaning they work for humans, why not? So the idea is, so the behavior that, that, people, that we want to target is coarse. If, if you can make it so the bacteria can't talk, or they can't hear, you can think about having new kinds of therapies for bacteria. And so what was really attractive about autoinducer 2 is that it seems to be very broadly spread. So then we had to get at the molecular biology and the biochemistry of this molecule. So the next thing that we did was we made we do the same thing we always do, is we made mutants that couldn't make autoinducer 2, and we figured out what's wrong with them. And we did this in E. coli, salmonella, and in Vibrio harvii. And what we found was that it was exactly the same gene in all three of those bacteria. And so we named it Lux S. And that's just because that's what letter we're up to in this <laughs> genes that control bioluminescence. And so then what we did, you know how there's all these genomes now out there, right? Like there's hundreds of bacterial species who, whose genomes have been sequenced. So what you can do is you can take the sequence of your gene and ask what other bacteria that are sequenced have that gene. And so we did that, and this is just sort of a partial list of some of the bacteria that we found that have a very highly conserved Lux S gene. And so um, I hope what you can see is that this is a who's who of pathogens. Right, I don't know who, let's see, uh, usually I have my, my uh, arrow one, two, three, four, thou, that's in the mailboxes around here, right, and so, right, so pick who you want, so that's anthrax, um, let's see, the bottom one, mycobacterium tuberculosis, that's tuberculosis, helicobacter pylori, that's ulcers, E. coli 0157, that's the hamburger one, Yersinia pestis, that's bubonic plague, staph, you have enterococcus, right, those are the ones you get at the hospital, we want to know, Borrelia burgdorferi, that's Lyme disease, gangrene, anyway, it's this unbelievable list of who's who of pathogens, so that's really good for me because my job is to fund this work, but I want to say that, um, in fact, this list is very skewed, because there's no, it is true that Luxess is in all of these pathogens, but people only sequence pathogens, right, there's no money in sequencing, you know, Vibrio harvii, for example, so tons of pathogens make this molecule, and that's really good because we do want to target this for antibiotics. But all kinds of other bacteria are also talking with this molecule. So I just want to say that the list is skewed, but it's very clear that it's in lots of different pathogens. And so, of course, we tested not only is the gene there, we showed that every single bacterium that you see there makes autoinducer 2, and we or somebody else in the field by now has made a mutant in Lux S, and every bacterium you see there, if the bacteria don't have Lux S, they can't make autoinducer 2. And so then the question is, are all these other bacteria on this list actually using this molecule for information? I mean, it's very clear that when Vibrio harvii encounters this molecule, it turns on these 100 genes. That's not, I mean, these other bacteria are certainly not turning on bioluminescence. They don't have bioluminescence. So the question for us was, what do these other bacteria do with this molecule? Are they using it to talk? And so we or others began to study at least some of the bacteria that are on that list and just ask what genes turn on or off in response to autoinducer 2. And this is a sort of short list, actually it's most of the bacteria because this is early days now, so we don't know about all the bacteria on the list. But at least the bacteria that you see there clearly use autoinducer 2 to control gene expression. And of course in every case, except for the case of Vibrio harvii, what the bacteria turn on are virulence traits. So biofilms, remember I told you that's what like pseudomonas makes. We understand now that the way bacteria live when they're in us, they're not just floating around, they're living in biofilms. Biofilms is a huge virulence trait, and it's something that's really interesting to try to target in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, because biofilms, the bacteria lay down on these surfaces, they cover themselves with this slime, and they're impervious to, tr to traditional antibiotics. So it turns out that making these associations requires quorum sensing, it requires autoducer 2 quorum sensing. And then all the other traits that you see down there are virulence, I don't know who you want to hear about, probably E. coli 0157. So for example, in that bacteria, it turns on an apparatus which is called a type 3 secretion system. So you know E. coli 0157 is this incredibly deadly bacteria, and the reason is because it has this thing called a type 3 secretion system. So the way E. coli 0157 makes you sick is that you eat it, 
it gets into your intestine and it comes up to your intestinal cells and then it makes this molecular syringe that punches through its membrane and the membrane of your cells and then it secretes into you literally like it looks like a syringe it injects straight into the cytoplasm of your cells toxins and that's why that bacterium is so bad for us because it's delivering toxins straight to the inside of your cells. And so again, that's a trait that's controlled by horses. It's periodontal, you know, you get cavities, bacteremia, blah, blah, blah. So, the, so what is clear is that at least in some bacteria, autoinducer 2, like autoinducer 1, is controlled virulence. And autoinducer 2 is this generic molecule. So maybe we can start to think about making these sort of non-traditional but broad spectrum antibiotics. And what I thought I would finish with tonight is to talk about just a few of the steps that we've taken for doing that. So if you want to make antibiotics so that the bacteria can't detect the molecule, you actually have to know what the molecule is. So the next thing for us to do, I mean, it's a red diamond, right? So the next thing for us to do is to actually hone in a little bit on the molecular biology of what that molecule is. It's probably not a red diamond. And so what we did, and this was in collaboration with Fred Houston, who's an x-ray crystallographer in my department, um, and, and my friend and colleague, we crystallized the sensor protein with the molecule inside of it. So we tracked them together and we solved the structure and that just gave us all of the atoms in the molecule. And so there it is. Um, and so there's nothing special that you have to know about this molecule except that it's very small. All the things that where you just see lines, those are carbons. It's very small and it's very simple. And that is just lucky for us because that turns out to be very nice if you're trying to make small molecule antibiotics, if you're trying to deliver molecules to humans, you know, big things are hard to make and they're hard to deliver. And so in fact, the molecule is very simple. We couldn't have you know, guessed that ahead of time. That just turned out to be a feature of the system. Okay, so now we know what the molecule is. And so the question is, how does one go about making anti autoinducer 2 therapies? So one way, so there's multiple strategies that were taking one way is if you could in inhibit Lux X, right? but that's the enzyme that makes the molecule. So that would make the bacteria mute. And so we're trying to do that. But I thought the strategy I would tell you about, I just picked one, would, it would be how to make the bacteria deaf. So instead of making them mute, how do you make them so they can't hear? And this again goes back to this bioluminescence stuff that we work on. And so remember, we have this Vibrio harvii strain of bacteria that turns on light when you give it autoinducer 2. And so what we want is a way to look through all kinds of candidate molecules for ones that impair uh, responding to the real molecule. And what we don't want to do is to do something hard, some horrible pathogen, right, to, to find that molecule. So what we want to do is to use this totally harmless strain that simply turns on or off light in response to autoinducer 2 to find this drug. Okay, so remember we have this molecule, the red diamonds, our autoinducer 2. If you give it that reporter strain, Light turns on. And so then, if that red diamond you now know is actually this molecule on the bottom, then what we can do, and this we're doing in collaboration with Marty Semelhack, who's a, who's a very fine natural products chemist in the chemistry department here at Princeton. What Marty does is he starts with this molecule, which is the real autoinducer 2, and then just sort of one by one, he changes like this OH to something else, or this CH3, he changes to something else, or this boron, it changes to a different atom. So if you have if that molecule, remember it's all in three dimensions, looks like this red diamond, then what Marty does is to put a bump on it, this yellow bump, right? So you have this thing that interacts with its sensor, Marty puts a little bump on it, and what he's trying to do is to make an antagonist that can't interact with the detector. So Marty has made a number of those molecules, and then we have to find which are the ones that impair detection of the real autoinducer. And so we have this reporter strain that if you give it regular autoinducer 2, light turns on. And so what we do is we give it the real autoinducer 2 plus one of Marty's molecules that has a bump on it, and we look for ones that can't make light. I mean, it's so easy, right? You just add those two things together and now look for ones that are inhibited in bioluminescence. And that gives you molecules that clearly interfere with detection of the real signal molecule. But of course, if I dump Clorox on these bacteria, they also will not make bioluminescence. And so we don't want just something that's toxic or that punches a hole in the membrane. We really want an anti-quorum sensing 
drug. We don't want something that kills the bacteria. That we have in the pharmaceutical industry. So we do this test, and anybody who inhibits in this test, then we go back, remember we have this other reporter strain that turns on light when you give it autoducer one. So now what we do is we give the molecules that we like from the first experiment to that strain, and we look for molecules that don't interfere. Right, so the bacteria still make life, right? So we just go back and forth. We look for ones that interfere with Lux Q detecting the real molecule, but that don't, should have no effect on the other system, right? So that it's not just something general that like poisons luciferates, right? It's specific that the information is going through the Lux Q detector, right? So is that clear? So we just go back and forth and back and forth with these two experiments and find molecules that interfere with the detection of autoinducer 2. And we have two of those molecules right now. And so now we actually do the experiments that I've been trying to avoid all my life by working on these very beautiful bacteria. Now what you want to know is do those help if you have a bacteria with an infection? So what we do is we have a bacterium that we know controls virulence through autoinducer 2 quorum sensing. That's vancomycin resistant enterococcus. It's Princeton, go big or go home. That's the worst one you can get right now. And we know if we put that bacterium just by itself into that mouse, that mouse dies. But if we give that with Marty's molecule, or any of these candidate molecules, then the question is, is the mouse dead or alive? And in fact, we have two molecules now that the mouse is alive. These are not drugs. Or you would have to take a pill that's <laughs> like this big right now, and it would kill you, right? And so anyway, so what happens now, this is what my group does. And what happens now, what won't happen at Princeton, but what will, I hope, happen from this is that a medicinal chemist gets his or her hands on these molecules, and they make them so that you only have to take a little pill so that it lasts a long time in your bloodstream so it doesn't have all these toxic side effects. There's many, many, many years of work to go from these candidate molecules from Marty's experiment to the real thing. But in fact, we're sort of on a hunt for that right now. The other thing that we've been doing, this is just a nuance, but I thought I'd tell you this, is that the obvious thing is to make bacteria, make antagonists, right, of autoinducer 2, molecules that inhibit um, autoinducer 2 detection. The other thing, when Marty makes, you know, so Marty just makes all these molecules, right, but other, some of the molecules that he makes actually work better than the real autoinducer, right? So the bacteria turn on bioluminescence or virulence early. And we actually think those are potential drugs as well, because remember, these associations with us, between the bacteria and us, are all optimized. If the bacteria turn on their virulence when there's too few cells, we think that that also might be the anti quorum sensing drug, because they turn on too early. And again, that's what your immune system is sitting around waiting for, and so those might work as well. Those are much harder to um, <laughs> convince the venture capitalists we're going to make these hyper virulent bacteria. <laughs> so anyway, but we have those in the fridge, and we're going to try these first. But I actually think that there's a place for those molecules as well. And then this is always this, you know, grim, doom and gloom talk. Remember, there's all kinds of things that bacteria do for us that we like. They make us all kinds of natural products and drugs that are good for humans. And in many cases, we'd like to enhance the quorum sensing capabilities of those bacteria. And so these other class of molecules might be good for those types of studies. OK, I'm a teacher, so I have to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I told it to you, and I have to tell you what I told you. Right? So here's what I hope I told you. Bacteria talk to each other. And they talk with little chemicals as their words. And it's a complicated lexicon. They certainly have at least two languages, intraspecies and interspecies. We think, remember, this field is 10 years old in any molecular sense. We think this is the tip of the iceberg because what autoinducer 2 does not do is say who the other guy is. And when these bacteria are, so there have to be other molecules to find, that's good because I need a job. Um, and like, for example, and I know this is gross after dinner, but like when you get these biofilms on your teeth, for example, in the morning, you know, you brush them off religiously, and the next morning they're back. And they're not just back, there's 600 species of bacteria in these biofilms on your teeth. And they're not there willy-nilly. You know, this guy is next to this one, is the, they're cities. So it's the carpenter who's next to the grocer and the librarian. You know, and these are these order architected communities. And you can't get those, we don't think, by just knowing self and other. There have to be molecules say who that other guy is. And that's what I feel is on a hunt for right now. There's many more molecules to find. What I just told you is that, with this idea of architecting these communities, 
Bacteria can absolutely, even with auto inducer one and auto inducer two, they can distinguish self from other. And what I would propose is that this is what the cells in your body are doing. Your heart cells do not get all confused with your liver cells every day, and that's because they each have their own jobs, they each do their own jobs, and it's mediated by chemical <coughs> communication with molecules like hormones. I think bacteria invented that. I think that we're just a sort of higher form of that, but I would I think that this is analogous. The strategies that these bacteria are carrying out is just like what's happening inside any higher organism. There's molecules that remain to be discovered, like who the, who, who the other is. And then I think, and we, in my field, we think you know, that all of these top things with them talking to each other, knowing self from other, knowing who the other guy is, and getting sort of group-specific jobs has to be how multicellularity developed. So the kinds of things these bacteria are doing in groups is exactly like what happens in higher organisms or in development in embryology. And we think, again, that just studying this, you know, we always hope that we're studying something bigger than what we're pipetting into that tube on that day. And what we think is that if we learn about core sensing in these very simplified systems, like I told you about, that the rules or the paradigms that we uncover are going to relate to how it works in higher organisms <coughs> and what goes awry in higher organisms when we get sick. So we do think we're studying something about higher organisms. What I spent the second half of my talk on is that there are clearly needed and, and opportunities for novel um, biotechnology, for making anti-corn sensing or pro-corn sensing strategies that can either stop corn sensing bacteria or help corn sensing bacteria, depending on what you want to do. And of course, we're not so smart you know, to think those up. You know, bacteria have been here for a billion years, and they've already thought this up. So what's become very clear in my field in the last couple of years is that these kind of anti-corn sensing strategies already exist out there just between bacteria. And so it's very clear that these guys are out there talking and talking, so they're releasing these molecules, one guy in the dirt, and the guy next to it is releasing an enzyme that cuts the molecule in half. So one poor guy is talking, and the guy next door is making them mute. And so all of these things where bacteria are eating eating each other's autoinducers or cutting each other's autoinducers in half or making molecules that are antagonists, they've already invented it. And all we want to do is try to copy those strategies for something that would be more helpful to the humans. And so that's where I think we are right now. And I just want to show you a picture. This is my lab. <coughs> there are people that have come and gone before this group. But this is who we are right now. And I just wanted to remind you that everything that I told you about, everything, I'm basically a glorified typist at this point in my life, but it was all done by these um, wonderful people, and I'm really lucky because this is a fantastic place that lets you work on all kinds of cockamamie things, and then these young people will, for some reason, think that that's a reasonable thing to do with their time. And so that's why I said, um, as of right now, so we took that picture a couple weeks ago. And so again, Deborah, and to the Princeton Adult School, uh, thanks so much for letting me come and tell you about that, and I'd love to take questions. I assume that's what you do, and thank you all for coming and listening to me. information and trade sort of helpful strategies with each other. Um, to, is that behavior, do we know, is that at all related to quorum sensing, or is that behavior mediated through a different mechanism? Right, so I'll try to repeat the questions. So the question is that we all read about, you know, how these bacteria are, are uh, exchanging pieces of DNA, like they make each other, they give each other antibiotic resistance, all kinds of different things. And is that related to corn sensing or not? The answer, of course, is yes. Um, <laughs> so, so they do that by mating. So remember how I told you about agrobacterium exchanging this mobile piece of DNA? All of this exchange of DNA that you read about in the newspaper is done by what's called conjugation, which is a fancy word so you don't have to say sex. It's bacterial sex, right? And again, these are these group behaviors that you need that you need um, lots of cells to do. And so in fact, that is very clearly controlled by corn sensing. And in fact, the very first behavior that was ever seen 
that, that was how they discovered DNA, was they saw one bacterium could give this genetic information to another in a very famous experiment. And it turns out, okay, so they discovered DNA, but if they'd been really clever, they would have discovered corn sensing a few years ago. Because in fact, it turns out that there's a, that a thing they call a pheromone, which is an autoinducer, that controls that process. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> DNA. Yeah, so in fact, the answer is yes. Yeah. where they're culturing marine bacteria to produce uh, various antibiotics. And uh, I learned that many marine organisms don't produce those antibiotics unless they're co-cultured with another organism. They produce them as secondary metabolites to kill the intruder that's invading its territory. Um, that having been said, I, I don't really understand the concept that you presented here. Why would you want to have interspecies communication? It doesn't appear to be a, you know, a, a malicious reason like I, I learned. Yeah, so there we hear that. So you know why why show your stuff? Right? And so I don't know the answer to that question. I'll of course answer it anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that question. And so I can think about that I think I do think about that in two ways. So sometimes so you're talking about these antagonistic relationships between hosts that are trying to keep from being colonized by bacteria, right? And so they're sniffing for little products that bacteria make so they can launch this attack, right? But there's other associations that are mutualistic between higher organisms and lower in, in bacteria, and also between bacteria. So like, for example, these biofilms that we that I keep bringing up. You know, you have these 600 species of, bi of bacteria in these biofilms. You get a cavity. That, you know, they're just trying to eat and grow. It turns out only the first three can stick to your teeth. But they can't do all the jobs that make that allow them to get the food. Right? They need the other, I don't know if they actually need all 597 of the others, but they need others, right? And so there are when when bacteria are in, are in these sort of consortia where they actually need, you know, I do this job A, you do job B, you do job C, and then we all profit from that. That's what I think you would want to show that you're there. But I can also argue exactly what you're saying, and we think about this a lot. When bacteria are in uh, niches where they're competing for scarce nutrients or things like that, you absolutely wouldn't want to show your stuff, right? And so one of the things is that in biochemistry I didn't tell you about is this molecule is made from these products of central metabolism. And there's this very toxic intermediate that if they don't make the signal, they actually commit suicide because so it's sort of like they have to. Do it. And so I think that that's a part of it, but I also think they all have all these strategies. Like some bacteria make it for a while, and then when other bacteria come around, they consume it, you know, like they're trying to hide. And so I think there's all these more sophisticated strategies that we just do not have a handle on, you know, because we're growing them in a test tube, not in mixes, right? And so I think we're just too far away from it at this point in our studies to be able to give any good answer to that. But I think about it both ways. Like I think you're right. You know, they wouldn't want to show their stuff, and then other times I think you're wrong, that they do want to communicate because they need some help from some other species. Well, yeah, I'm wondering if they can turn that cooperative, malicious type of relationship on or off, because the marine environment is very harsh. Uh, I, so, I assume so, right? You yeah, know, and I, I assume it's niche specific, right. you know? When you're fat and happy, you don't care, you know? And, and I think that that's, and we're just too early to be able to like satisfactorily answer your question. I mean, one experiment that we did do this year, Karina Chevier, she's in there next to me, um, she did put them in mixtures and she showed absolutely in real time they were impacting each other's profiles of gene expression. You know, so she, and so one idea is that like these kinds of things like this, like all this corn sensing is like how you fend off, you know, invaders, you know, like that they're all listening into each other and that they really do manipulate these signals, you know, and that in your gut, you know, or in all these other niches. And we're trying to explore those things, but I keep saying this, it's really early days for that. We'd love to get at that. That bugs us. <laughs> Literally bugs us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The form strength, uh, sensing strikes me as very binary. Could you talk about the theoretical possibilities to apply this to some form of biologically based computing? Yes, yeah, so I would, I, uh, not very deeply, I can't talk about that, but actually um, Ron Weiss is doing that right here. So he's in our engineering department, and he's thinking about how one would make circuits, how one would make patterns, like if you had one guy that's making it, one that guy that's consuming it, a guy that dies when he sees it. So he's doing actually all of those things he wants to do things like tissue engineering and like making DNA circuits that do different things. And so again, 
you know, this is the earliest possible time, but there's a lot of thought about using these things to get patterns, right? And, um, and you're right, they're on-off molecular switches. And so just, so we work with the theoretical physicist, Ned Wingreen, and so we don't actually want to do anything practical like that, but we think a lot about how, like if you think about it, and this is like sort of, you know, the blend of molecules inside one single cell is dictating what the population is doing. And likewise, what the population is doing is telling, is, is defining what's inside those cells. And we are trying to understand these switches at all of those levels, from the individual to the population, right? And, 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 and they're really interesting switches. Like, there's other switches that bacteria have that are like dimmer switches, you know, they're graded. This one is on off. And that was shown very clearly with Ned, because the idea is, for, if you think about what form sensing is, it is this definitive switch. You cannot, kind of be quorum sensing. You're either going alone, you're acting as part of the group. And so what we think is that that switch should be ultra sensitive. If you're off, then you're on. And in fact, a lot of the bells and whistles inside the circuit were up to Lux S, because there's a lot more genes involved right, in this than I showed you tonight. And all of those work together to make this hypersensitive switch, where other behaviors are not like that. Right? And in some way, you can think about the biology. We can. Like it makes, you know, we just make these stories up. But it makes sense to us that the quorum sensing switch should be off or on. And it seems to be, and it's built into how these proteins interact with one another, both at the individual level and at the population level. And we spend a lot of time, you know, you know, a lot of people are spending time thinking about these beautiful switches that don't mess up, because you're dead, right, if you do, yeah. We're not gonna do something good with it, though. I told you that they think we're doing it. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, what else? Yes. Uh, is quorum sensing related to mitochondria in our cells? Uh, I don't know. So the idea is that, so I never hear that as it relates to mitochondria. So mitochondria were bacteria, right? Like that's, so, so, um, so they have many features that are very bacterial-like. What I can tell you is that so far, um, no one has found quorum sensing in anything except bacteria. There's very clearly all of these um, counting mechanisms in eukaryotes. You know, in probably in mitochondria, also like your cells and embryos are counted. You know, at each step in development, you know, there's clearly all these things. You know, that have to be counted. You, know, you don't grow forever. You know, your liver gets this big, and so we know that there's these counting mechanisms. But nobody has found yet something that really smacks of quorum sensing. Right, because quorum sensing is not stopping growth, right? Like you know, like your liver cells growth. It's changing behavior, right? And so I think that's a matter of time. I think they'll find it in yeast first, right? Sort of the next step up. And I, you know, and I think it's much harder. I mean, you're, you might have you don't turn on off bioluminescence, right? I mean, we had such an easy way to get into this ten years ago because of that bioluminescence. And I just think like, like trying to figure those things out is just much harder. You know, because it, it, it could be because of things you said, like maybe you need that mitochondria in the context of a cell. You know what I mean? You can't just get that to happen in a test tube, right? Because it's got to have all these other things around it. But I think it's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. Can you switch off the communications by, I'm just curious, uh, from a clinical point of view, by putting some uh, steroid in the, into the medium or some sort of uh, chemotherapy that would drop the immune system? Somewhere. Yeah, so that would be interesting too. So people, so again, this is early, so there's only a couple of papers about whether our immune system is tuned into these molecules. And that hasn't been done for auto or 2, but then for auto or 1, because we know more about those, right? And so there are some indications that in fact your immune system is responding even to these little molecules. And so that is one possibility, is that you could actually go from that angle instead of the angle I'm talking about. And that is absolutely being explored. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, is this, the, the auto inducers, are they basically a waste product? I think that they, so the question is, are they a waste product? And I think this goes back to your question, it's showing your stuff. I think, so we know all the biochemistry of how these, these work. We know all the steps in making these molecules. And I think original, and it's very clear, they're sort of leftover products from just sort of central metabolism. That's sort of like the boring stuff you do that just keeps you alive. Right? And it's very clear all of them, both AI1s and AI2s, probably 
started as just leftovers, and they leak out because the cells didn't need them. But of course, as soon as you leak something out, there's this number component. And so they have evolved mechanisms for tuning into that. But when you look at these molecules, they really, and you look at all the steps that go to Lexus, they really look like they're just leftovers. And I think that the, the appreciation that's happening, I think, in, the, in my field right now, is that, there's, that we know these couple because they turned on light, and now we can say that those guys turn on virulence in other bacteria, right? You know, things that you can't just see with your eyes. But what we are understanding now is that there's probably hundreds of molecules outside these bacteria. You know, they're interpreting this incredible chemical world, right? And okay, we only see things that impinge on bioluminescence in our experiment, right? And so there could be 98 more molecules out there that we have no idea of. Now that technologies exist, that one can begin to study those things without having to have that amazing pattern. You know, we have genome arrays, we have chips, right, that you can just look at how the whole genome turns on and off. You know, you just add these culture fluids. And so I think that the next few years are going to be filled with molecules. You know, what, what we do now, all we know how to do when we look at genomes is to look for Lux I and to look for Lux S, right? And that came out of this bioluminescence. But there have to be, as we talk about many more molecules, and probably it's all this gush that for 100 years we've been studying bacteria, like, oh, that's boring, right? You know, these leftover metabolites. But in fact, that is, you know, what these bacteria encounter. And so I think that that's coming. And there's very much more sophisticated ways than what we did in the past to begin to look for like what we call the metabolome. Instead of the genome, it's the metabolome, you know, right? There's a genome, the proteome, and that's the next one that's coming. And people are really interested in that. And it's going to be done in bacteria because it's simple first, because it's simpler. So I think that's going to help my field a lot. So effectively, the waste product is very similar to the way that mammals use their urine to mark their territory. Yeah, this, it turns out that that molecule I showed you, it looks really like a, a cockroach pheromone. Which, you know, it's not really how I dreamed my life was going to turn out, but, but in fact, it turns out that those molecules are called furanones, those ringed molecules, and they are the kinds of things that make strawberries smell sweet. They're, kind, they're very similar to, to clearly bona fide pheromones that ants and cockroaches use for chemical communication. And so I think, I don't know that they'll all be related, but there's some very, those molecules have really interesting properties just from the point of view of being signals, right? And in fact, they look similar to ones that are known signals in higher organisms. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, well, cockroach there, it's something right Christmas card. Does lack of forward sensing have anything to do with the proliferation of cancer cells? Okay, so there is, so that's the question, is there a connection to cancer? And so, again, there's no evidence for this because there's no like real form sensing yet in eukaryotes, but there are people who are working on that. What's so amazing about cancer, I didn't draw you pictures of biofilms, but what happens with biofilms is that you get a colony. So you get one bacteria that sits down on the surface and then it grows and it spreads and it gets bigger. And then as part of that biofilm, there are molecular mechanisms that make some of those, so the biofilm is established, right? Now you have this bigger thing than just a column. You get this sort of micro environment of cells. And then some cells break away at a particular time and they go colonize elsewhere, which really smacks of metastasis, right? And so there is this growing idea in cancer that when you look at the steps of cancer and metastasis, it looks just like the cartoons that we're drawing in the biofilm field, right? And so people are trying right now to look like if you take, there's the classic core sensing experiment, which is you take cells, you get rid of them, and you take the liquid, and you add them back to cells and see now, you know, you can just treat these cells, right? If you have cells at low cell density, if you add autoinducer, they do the high cell density thing. So the idea is, the experiment that's being done is you can take cancer cells at high cell density, collect the liquid, add them to low cell density cancer cells, and then see if they do something new, right? It's complicated, but in fact, there's a lot of hints that at least at first blush, the steps look the same, right? And so that is actually, those experiments are being done. I think that would be amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. Is there any communication between viruses and bacteria? Nobody's seen that yet. And so it's hard to imagine, so you guys know probably, I don't know if you've had virus talks already, you know that viruses are these things, you know, they're really alive or not. You know, they're alive when they're inside 
a host cell taking advantage of all of your machinery, right? They're these sort of particles that they really replicate everything by hijacking your equipment and doing that. And so, um, again, remember, we only know to look for Luxi and Luxess. It's clear those are not in viral genomes that we know about. But if they had some other molecule, or I think the more reasonable idea is that they would be using the host's system to count themselves. What's so very clear when viruses get in a cell, they grow to a certain cell number, say 1,000 and then the cell bursts, right? And the numbers are actually pretty tight, right? And so there's some, but nobody's found anything like that in them. But there is sort of like a bacterial brain, there's also like a viral brain, isn't there? Well, the brain or to me is the DNA, right? Period, I mean, to me, right? I mean, when you have a collection, very large collections, a billion well, bacteria together is like a, a brain or an intelligence, it, it, and the it, same thing with viruses. It's certainly the populations do things that, that you can't get out of the individuals, right? I don't know if that's intelligence, right? To me, all is DNA, right? It's just turning on, I mean, I'm obvious what I think is turning on and off gene expression at different times, right? And so no one's found anything convincing, but again, they haven't found it in anything except bacteria, which, you know, could just be bacteria. Or even doubt it. Either the pathways that you're talking about doing some sort of possible antibiotic in the future? Are they used in other higher organisms that have organized tissues? So the that, question, yeah, so. Would that interfere or do not? Right, so the question is, are there, do the pathways, I should go back to my, well, to the model, in higher organisms? No, and I should have said this, thank you. That's what's really great about autoinducers and their sensors, is they are clearly not in humans, right? So if you want to make anti-AI2 or anti-AI1 molecules, we do not make that molecule. We don't have those detectors, right? And so the hope, and it is just that, is that this would be, you know, because that's what you're trying to do is to, to get selectivity and take advantage of something the bacteria is doing that you're not doing so you don't kill you. And so none of those genes are in eukaryotes, in higher organisms. And that's, that, that was lucky too for us. Well, thanks, you guys. That was really